something. Welcome everybody to the January GPS Training Podcast with myself and Andy. Welcome Andy. Hello. And I hope you had a good Christmas and New Year. We did, yes. Very good. We're again streaming the um, podcast live on Facebook. So uh, please just search for GPS Training on Facebook and don't forget to like our page. Um, a copy of the live stream will also be available on, on YouTube. So we'll, um, we'll upload that um, over the next couple of days so you'll be able to see what we look like. Um, um, when we've been recording the podcast. It's a podcast with a little bit of a different, we're changing things as we move forward. We've, this is our fifth podcast and uh, we like to evolve and keep changing. So we're making the podcast more into a bit of a magazine program. It will always evolve the podcast, but what we're doing is make a bit of a magazine program and a little bit less techie, because I think over the last couple of issues, we've got a little bit techie and we do have a quarterly GPS clinic which we do live on Facebook. And if you've never watched our GPS clinic, it's on the 1st of February, the uh, GPS clinic at six o'clock in the evening. So get that uh, in your diary, 1st of February at six o'clock in the evening. You can log on to Facebook and watch our live GPS clinics. So that's gonna hit the more techie side of things. And then what we're wanting to do is bring the podcast more of a, a magazine program. So this is the first podcast where we're gonna incorporate some pre-recorded information. So we're gonna record some We've already recorded some uh, an interview, uh, which we're going to have a, a, a look at in a little while. So that's going to be incorporated into the podcast, which hopefully will make it a little bit different as we move forward in 2018. Um, again, um, the the gentleman we've got on this podcast is a guy called Pete Mason, who owns his own, uh, who runs his own podcast, which is called the Post Cash, which is a geocaching. Uh, it's a geocaching podcast. Um, but if you think of any guests in the future that you would like to hear on the, our podcast please just get in touch and we can uh, do some interviews with those people and get them on. And they don't have to come here to us at your GPS training, as you'll hear, we did it remotely. So we're able now to do remote interviews. Um, again, please continue with your feedback. And as we evolve and as, as the podcast goes forward, we'll hopefully incorporate your thoughts. So without further ado, let's get on with today's podcast. In today's podcast, we're going to look and chat over the following. First thing we look at is Garmin bird's eye. What is it? as it can be a number of things. Second things we're gonna look at, as, as we've already mentioned, we've got this in-depth interview with Pete Mason of the podcast show. So if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, you'll need to download the podcast to hear this in its entirety. We've got Andy's top tips with the both Garmin and SatMap. And the big debate is when we're out walking, should we plan and follow a route or a track? Next thing we're going to look at is our two day GPS training course and also our one day sat map course. And then the final thing we're going to look at is Irish mapping options for both the Garmin and the sat map GPS. So the first thing is Garmin bird's eye. Garmin bird's eye is one of two things, Andy. It's a bit of a confusing, this is how we brought it in because we've had a few customers uh, talking to us. So what are the two things that it can be, Andy, this bird's eye? Satellite. Subscription is the first thing, yeah. isn't it? So Garmin talk about something called bird's eye, which is either a subscription or can be a voucher that you buy. The second part of what we're going to talk about is about the vouchers called bird's eye select. But the first thing is, is something called bird's eye satellite subscription. Now, this is something that you get included with some of the GPS devices that we sell for free right. for a year. Mm -hmm. So if you buy an Oregon 700 series, a GPS map 64S or one of the newer Montanas, you get this satellite subscription for free. And you can purchase it, can you, as well as getting it for free? So or? if you haven't bought a unit that's got it for free or after the year's up, you can buy it for another year for £21.99. Right. It has to be done directly from Garmin's okay. site. You would just search satellite subscription. And any of the later generation colour screen units will work. Garmin have a, a list on their website of which units are compatible. Brilliant. So that's the first thing, you get it free with some of these units. So what happens is when you register your new unit that's got this included, you automatically, using Garmin's free planning software called Basecamp, you can select an area anywhere in the world, Okay. draw around that area using the tools within the software, uh -huh. and download it to your Basecamp software. Right. 
but you've got that forever, haven't you? So once you've downloaded it, it's yeah. yours forever. Yeah, the year is after a year, you can't download any more right. unless you pay again. Mm -hmm. But f whatever you download in that year, you keep. So it goes on your software first. So it means you can be looking on your planning software rather than looking at, say, the Ordnance Survey maps on your unit. Yeah. You can then change the view to a satellite image of where you're going to go walking or maybe doing some survey work. Brilliant. So that's the first thing. You download it, the software, but you can send it to your unit as well, which is the beauty. It means you can be out in the field and you can turn off your Ordnance Survey map and bring the satellite imagery into view. Right, OK. Um, one thing I will say when you download this satellite imagery, um, they have a few choices of resolution. There's a standard high and highest. Now, if I'm honest, I don't find the standard very good. Yeah. Um, the high is the one I tend to use due to the memory it takes. So the highest is great for viewing on your computer screen, but if you download it as the highest, it takes up a little bit too much memory. How much I memory think. does that use in the unit right. then? So just to give you an idea, the idea of this satellite subscription, you just download a small area, you don't get carried away and download the whole, the whole of, the of a national, yeah. or certainly not the whole of the country, <laughs> you don't download even a whole national park, you would download a few small areas right. maybe for that walk you're going to do the next day. Um, just to give you an example, if you downloaded 1500 square kilometres, this is just approximate, mm -hmm. which is about half the size of the Lake District National Park or mm -hmm. potentially a couple of Explorer maps, that would take up at the medium setting, so what we call the high setting um, of resolution, that would take up 500 megabytes of memory right. either on your unit or you could put a blank micro SD card. It's typical Garmin, isn't it? Standard high and highest. Can't we have stand, like low, medium, and high? It's typical Garmin, standard high and highest, which is totally confusing, isn't it? So the high one is, as you say, about 500 megabytes, megabytes for 1500, for 1500, square, 1500 kilometers. square kilometers. And then the highest. It's about a gigabyte. So right. that's a lot of memory. If, if I was downloading it at the highest resolution, I'd be putting a blank micro SD card in the unit rather than downloading it to the internal storage. Right, okay. But what I tend to do is do a very small area, pick the um, that I'm going to do a walk in, pick the high, which is the middle one, yeah. and just download that small area to the memory of the unit, okay. and then delete it out of the unit when it's not required. Right. Because um, you store it on Garmin, basically you just transfer that folder, that, that yeah. file over, just like you can with mm. the birds, iMac and Now, I was asked recently about, again, where it covers. Now, I know I mentioned the whole world, but Garmin do have a little disclaimer, just to say, obviously, different parts of the world, the quality and resolution mightn't be as good in certain countries what i found in this country is absolutely fine but just bear in mind that another country mightn't be as good quality what you're doing brilliant with. and there are some videos in our online resource so go to gps training online resource there are some videos and he's done talking through the process of downloading the bird's eye satellite imagery so bird's eye satellite imagery is the, the first term and the second one is a bird's eye select voucher which you can use to download 125,000 map in this country plus lots of other way of mapping doesn't it so how does this work andy and uh, it's a bird's eye voucher it's a physical voucher which you scratch off the code don't you put yeah. it into the so in our on our website under the gps store under garmin mapping we have this voucher that you can purchase for 19 pounds 99 we'll post you out the voucher yeah. um, if you're giving it a present it's a nice thing to have the voucher to give to someone if you want it quickly and you don't want to pay postage, we can just email you this code. That Because all you do when you get the voucher, you scratch off this code on the back. It's like playing the lottery, is it? Scratch yeah. off. <laughs> scratch off. <laughs> or you win some map. You, know, uh, you don't win a prize, I'm afraid. But So with this voucher, then, that you, you, you basically register it to your Garmin account, to your Garmin GPS device. Our online training resource have got lots of videos showing you how you use the voucher and how you do the download. But in a nutshell, when you've registered this thing called the Bird's Eye Select Voucher, you have to select the country initially that you want to use it in. So you've obviously got Great Britain. Please note Ireland, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland isn't covered. I know we're going to talk about that later on in we the are, podcast. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's Great Britain. And then the other countries that you can select from, there's a full list on our website under the voucher. But just to give you a few examples, if you're going to France, it lets you download 1,500 square kilometres of IGN 1 to 25 mapping. Germany, they've got a couple of examples. They've got Compass Mapping, um, which is a product you can buy as a paper map in Germany. You get 1 to 50 Compass Mapping scale, but you get 2,400 square kilometres you can download for one voucher. But they then have another map product for Germany called BKG Mapping, which is 1 to 25 scale. And due to obviously what a li whatever licensing agreement Garmin have got with that company in Germany, you can actually download 500 square kilometers. So there's different map types, isn't there, in some of these overseas countries? So what, what, how, what are the different map types then? How, do, how, do, how will they work? 
So I suppose if you look at it in this country, we have Ordnance Survey Mapping, which we all know, yeah. and there's also a company called Harvey Maps. They're brilliant. Nice, right, nice Harvey paper maps, maps yeah, yeah. but they don't do any digital maps for a Garmin GPS. Right. So in this country, with a Garmin, if you're using the bird's eye voucher to download some more detailed yeah. 1 to 25 mapping, which is, sorry, I didn't mention at the start there, when you use the voucher in this country, you're using it to, where you may have bought a, a GPS with 1 to 50 mapping, if you want to download a small area of 1 to 25 you get 3,000 square kilometres per yeah. voucher. So, you know, we have OS and Harvey's, but we can only use the voucher for OS. But Germany, they've got a choice of compass or this BKG mapping. So you've got two choices of what what you can use the voucher and for. And I suspect as well, if you're walking in Germany, you'll know which one you'll, you'll like, yeah. won't you? So, so say like in this country, you know whether you walk with the Harvey or Ordnance Survey map and yeah. you can choose that. If you go to Germany, you'll know which one that you'll be wanting to do. And I suspect if you Google, you may see the different yeah. map sets and see what each yeah. of them look one like. One thing to mention on the bird's eye vouchers, the select vouchers. So the satellite subscription we mentioned a year, once you've downloaded it, um, it's, it's there for life, but after a year, you can't download any more. With the bird's eye select voucher, um, again, when you download it, it's on your computer for life. But when you register the voucher to the particular country that you want, you can only use it for that one country then. You've got 90 days to use up all of the credits. So if you only download, say, say it's this country where you get 3,000 square yeah. kilometres. If you download 1,000 square kilometres initially, you've got to make sure you do the other 2,000 square kilometres, which could be in another part of this country, before the 90 days is up. And but then again, you've got, you've got the maps forever. Again. And then you've got it forever on your computer, and then you transfer it onto your GPS device. And how much do these vouchers cost in the bird's eye vouchers? Nineteen ninety nine per voucher. That's brilliant. And to be honest, that's I know we've talked a lot in depth about the different map sets, but the reality is 99.9% vouchers that leave here will be used to buy 3,000 square kilometres of 1 to 25,000 mapping because a lot of people have got the 1 to 50,000 map cards on their Garmin and they want areas of that. And 3,000 square kilometres is about the size of Lake District National Park, isn't yeah. it? And the yeah. final thing I'll see on that, we talked about memory on the satellite imagery. One bird's eye voucher downloaded for this country for Ordnance Survey 1 to 25 in Great Britain takes up about 90 megabytes. It's quite a small amount of memory. So on the on the newer units, you've normally got enough memory on the on the unit for a few vouchers. You only want to be careful with Etrex 20. Only has enough memory really for one voucher, so you would end up having to put a blank micro card in. Brilliant, so fantastic. Like. So that's hopefully clarified the bird's eye, the term that Garmin uses bird's eye, which either can be bird's eye a satellite subscription, or as Annie's just explained now, or bird's eye select voucher, which is a way that you can download the 125,000 map in this country, or you can use it for some other overseas areas. I say, if there's any questions, just get in touch with us. The next thing on today's podcast is interview with Pete from the podcast show. So, um, Pete is a is a, a a great individual. I had a good chat with him um, last week when I recorded this. Um, he has his own um, podcast, which is called the Podcast Show, and he is a fanatical geocacher. So, geocaching. Uh, if you don't know what geocaching is, don't worry. We go over that in the interview. Uh, it will all become explained. So, here's my quick talk with um, with Pete from the Podcast Show. So, for new for 2018, we have a special guest on the GPS Training Podcast, and it's Pete, and sadly Tracy, his uh, wife, uh, is not with us, but they from the podcast show, which is a monthly geocaching podcast. So, welcome, Pete, and many thanks for joining us here at GPS Training Podcast. Oh, thanks very much, John. Thank you. Very good. Um, you have a monthly podcast, is that right? So, I, I listen to it, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, um, your, your podcast. It's an award-winning podcast, isn't it? So, it's the podcast show isn't it and right. you very much you lie you record very much in the field isn't it yeah that's the uh, that's the the idea behind it we uh when we go out geocaching we usually take a, a voice recorder with us and uh you know sometimes we 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 record things that are, are worthwhile and other times you know we, we dismiss it all because it's you know it's been windy or whatever and we haven't recorded it properly but the idea is that we we catch a um what we're doing when we're geocaching so and people like that they like the, the feeling that they're they're out with us mm -hmm. so it's a good it's a good listen i'm not just saying it's a it's a good listen and how long have you been doing it for then the, the podcast um well we first started in october 2011 right so and we've just we've just passed our uh 76th episode Fantastic. um i think we did uh, one we did we once did two in a month for some reason uh, <laughs> but uh normally it's it's one a month once, yeah, one a month's enough, isn't it? A fair bit of work goes oh, yeah. into it because yours is quite. It's edited together with lots of different stories, isn't it? So a fair bit of putting it together. Oh, that's right. I mean, we have regular uh, 
uh, contributors, which, which helps a great deal. And uh, uh, many of them are, are, you know, personal friends, like who come geocaching with us. So it, it makes it easier for us that if if people uh, contribute. But um, otherwise, we we record everything ourselves. Brilliant. So what I brought you on the podcast this month for is to explain a little about geocaching as you can be a resident geocaching expert and uh, you can <laughs> explain to the listeners a little about geocaching because most of our listeners have got uh, GPS units. Some have done some geocaching, some have maybe seen on the GPS, don't know anything about it. So we're going to just look at some of the, uh, yeah, look at geocaching, talk a little bit about geocaching and then hopefully inspire the people to get the GPS units and, and get out there geocaching. So the first basic question really Pete, is, what is geocaching well um it's always described as a, a, a high-tech treasure hunt so it's um using satellites to find basically uh plastic boxes you know hidden well any anywhere it's, when people say treasure hunt though people it's not actually treasure what you do what you're more likely to find is um a plastic uh container Mm-hmm. something like a you know a tupperware container or whatever um with a logbook in there which you sign and you can then claim that that as a as a find um there may be other things in there that people have left sometimes people leave stuff in for children say if children yeah. are uh, a geocaching and, and people swap things and that but on the whole most geocaches are little plastic containers with a, a logbook in there there is a lot more to geocaching than that but basically that's that's what it is and, and you you download the geocaches onto your onto your gps and um and go out and search for them is that all done through geocaching.com is there other, other options i know garmin a number of years ago tried to compete with geocaching.com i think they're throwing that away now but is everything now just done through geocaching.com well uh mainly yes uh, uh, there is a, a a website called open caching yes. which is um it's a, it's a similar sort of thing but it's uh, it's nowhere near on the scale of of, of geocaching.com. You know the, the, that is the main. If you search for geocaching, you, you're going to go to geocaching.com um, because that's the the biggest site. Brilliant, and it's it's worldwide, isn't it? This the, the, it is. is. Are we going to call yeah. it a game? Is it a game or not? Or is that a bit? Yeah, I think I think it's a game. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's I, I wouldn't call it a sport. Yeah. I mean, what people what somebody said once said to me is that if you're the sort of person who's who likes sitting in front of a computer and people are always having a go at you for doing, for not being out in the yeah. in, you know in the fresh air. <laughs> Geocaching is perfect. You can do both. Yeah. You know, you can, you can sit in front of your computer, organise where you're going, and then get outside and get a bit of fresh air. You know, but um, <laughs> the the yeah, you're saying it's it's a worldwide. I I'd, I'd, I looked this up before you phone. Uh, uh, there are there are three million geocaches hidden. Wow, in, that's, in, in, that's uh, a number, isn't it? Yeah, in in over 190 different countries, um, and uh, there's user users there there is uh well eight eight hundred over eight hundred thousand in the usa three hundred and fifty thousand in germany and a hundred and sixty thousand in this country so it, it's extremely popular there's one or two folk doing it isn't there and on oh, yeah. geocache.com there's a number of different there's a basic membership i think you'll be premium membership what what's the difference between the membership if somebody's going on to geocache.com for the first time what's the difference between the different memberships Right. Well, the the basic membership uh, only allows you to see a certain number of geocaches. Right. Uh, I ones that um, are, are of a certain. The, all geocaches have got a, a, a sort of a system where it's uh, sorted between you know difficulty yeah. and terrain. Mm-hmm. So if there's something up a tree, mm-hmm. it's going to be a high terrain. Right. And high difficulty, you see. But the, if you're just a basic member, you're only going to see ones that are one i think it's one and a half terrain and one and a half difficult okay, right yeah you know and there's also um certain other things you can do uh, in G- on geocaching.com which is sort the geocaches into different you know sort of just you can leave out ones you don't want to do i.e tree climbs or, yeah. or diff- difficult puzzles or whatever well you can't do that if you're just a basic member mm-hmm. but I, I will add i, I, I mean i'm I, we became uh, premium members fairly quickly mm-hmm. because it, because it, it in the end it's like it costs about fifty pence a week. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, we had we have never had a problem with you know because it's a hobby that you know that we we can all all the family can do and for fifty pence a week that's just yeah, it's, nothing. 
I don't do an awful lot of GCash. I do a little bit, but I'm I'm a premium member there because again, it's it's such a small amount of money, isn't it? You, you, yeah, that's you right. might as well yeah. just do it. If you're going to do it, do it properly, aren't you? Really? So, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And when you do, because when you when you look at these, these, there's lots of different cash types. Isn't there? The the main ones right. is a traditional cash, which I think you've just talked about. Um, what kind of containers have you found when you're out geocaching, which is a traditional cache? What kind of things do people... I know you said a Tupperware container, but are there yeah. other things that people use? Well, this this is probably the most asked question because when somebody starts geocaching, they say, well, what am I looking for? Yeah. So if you remember when we used to buy um, uh, ca- uh, film for cameras, yes. yeah. it came in those little black um, pots, mm-hmm. little plastic pots, you're saying. So the... the People still use a lot of them. Okay, yeah. Right? Because they're waterproof, you mm-hmm. see. You know, but you can f- find things that are a lot smaller than that. And if you think you, there, there are some that are the size of your so your, your, your fingernail. Right. And, mm-hmm. and they'll be magnet, magnetic, say, and stuck, you know, on something mag- magnetic. And uh, But then there's, there are other ones where people have used things like um, ammunition cans, ammo right. cans. Fantastic. Uh, and... Um, so there are some extremely big ones, you know, like uh, there's a plastic barrel somewhere. I think it's in Gloucestershire somewhere, and it and it's it's called the biggest. I think it's called the biggest geocache in Gloucestershire. Or something. It's only in Gloucestershire. But but, but you, the thing is, you've got to find these things, and nobody else. You don't want anybody else finding them. No, you don't that's want right. people finding them, you know, who, and think, what's this, you know? We've got because to talk there's... about the people who, there's, you call them the muggles, isn't it? The people who that's are not right. geocaches, aren't they? You call them the muggles, yeah. which I always think is fantastic. That's from Harry Potter, I think, isn't it? Where you, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. And in Harry yeah. Potter, they're the people who, um, a non-magical person in Harry Potter, isn't it? The muggles. <laughs> that's right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, you've, 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 I mean, if you don't hide, if they're not hidden well, they're going to get found, I mean, and often um geocaches go missing mm-hmm. um to give you some uh, uh, an example i've got uh, some geocaches placed nearby i took the dog for a walk earlier mm-hmm. and yesterday somebody had, couldn't find two of them right so, so i've been out today to try and find them and one of them is disguised as a snail okay on, on the fence you see right. so you would think well that's a snail on the fence i'm not getting hold of that but it's actually a geocache you know the, the snail vacated its shell a long time ago <laughs> and um it, so it was still there, but you see, and I think it was probably somebody who's not been in the game long, yeah. and they were they possibly wouldn't have been looking. They're possibly looking for a, a plastic pot. You see, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's a learning curve with geocaches, and believe me, even after seven years, I'm still finding geocaches and, and thinking, wow, that's fantastic. Someone's been very imaginative when they've uh, oh, yeah. hidden it. There are some some extremely imaginative people imaginative people in geocaching uh and, and i'm pleased to say i know a few of them you know and, and i think where do you get your ideas from you know mm-hmm. the yeah. other thing is well you have these trackables don't they these trackables which are people put things into caches and then you log in where they would like to go to is that right tell us a little bit about yeah. those will you yeah that's right well there's uh, often they're, they're just little tags they look like um the tags that uh, soldiers were uh, dog tags mm-hmm. Yeah, and they've got a, a, a number on them. Mm-hmm. And uh, if any and people like I say put them in geocaches. If somebody finds them, you you can log that number, right. and that means you've found a trackable. And the idea is you move them on to your, to an, another geocache, one that will take you know take uh, that's big enough to take a, a, a trackable. Mm-hmm. Now, now some people make all sorts of things trackable. Right. right? Um. They you know they they make the dog trackable. Okay. Right? Okay. So so the dog might have a, a collar collar on that's um you know got this trackable on. Some people, including uh, myself and Tracy, have tattoos that are, so people <laughs> can see this our 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 tattoo has got a trackable number on it, so people can log that. Fantastic. Um, I've seen all sorts of things made trackable. Ironing boards. Uh, <laughs> uh, baby's high chair was one recently. And uh, one of these enormous um, stuffed toys that this chap who brought it to one of our events could only just about get it in his car. Right. Uh, so it's gone. It got, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a like a, a fun part of geocaching. Um, but on the whole, the, the trackables are just little... Uh, like I said, dog tags. That you can track around. And, P, how many geocaches have you actually found since you've been geocaching? What what number is this a lot compared to other people? What what, what yeah, what, what number do people <laughs> yeah. average find in a year? 
Right, okay, yeah. Um, well, we found just over 5,000. Right. And, and I always say, well, you know, we... We, we both work full time. Mm -hmm. um, this is why my wife's not here today. Right. Uh, but um, so, which is not bad in in seven years. But I just again looked up um, the the top UK finder uh, has found fifty six thousand. Right. right. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And he's a sort of. I've met him. He's from Nottinghamshire, I think. And um, it, you you would have to be out every single day, yeah. I think. Yeah. to get those sort of numbers and it can very quickly become an, obs an obsession mm -hmm. uh, not, i mean it's not a bad obsession you know mm -hmm. but but i have met people who are really um into the num you know get yeah. as many numbers as possible the higher the better but i think one thing that you often well you talk a lot in your podcast is actually is is those special caches no there are all those people i'm going to go out yeah. and get 20 caches today and, and bag it but actually what you specialize on which i, I really like the way you do is actually you you have you go through themes of uh podcast uh, of, sort of caches and and special yeah. ones and you often talk about you know going for a walk and finding one cache often is as good as going out and finding 20 caches because it's, it's a special cache isn't it really that's right i mean we like to get uh ones that are that are, that are over 10 years old uh -huh. um because if you think about it, these have been hidden and not found and not, you know, stolen or anything. Mm -hmm. but, or, um, and they've been there 10 years and, and that's pretty good. You know, you've got to be a pretty good geocacher to hide something that nobody else can find. Uh, well, not nobody else yeah. can find. Geocacher can find it because they know where it is, you know. But, um, but for the, 10 the, years, the, the yeah, 10 the years, I remember. Public, yeah, 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 yeah. General public muggles can't find or whatever. <laughs> you know? That's fantastic. And, and there, there are some uh, that date back to uh 2000 when geocaching started right okay uh, so these these are really special ca geocaches that people will travel all over the world to try and find this there's, there's some most of them are in america right um and um you know they are, that's a part of the game that people like that they find a geocache that's placed in every month since geocaching right. uh, began in in uh, in two thousand in, in the year 2000 you see mm -hmm. uh, we're still quite away from sort of doing that you know there's a grid uh sort of if you think of a you know a month for every year uh, since two th since the year 2000 mm -hmm. up, up till now well we, we you know we've uh there's quite a few that we we haven't found but um yeah we like doing that we like to, we like to find old caches and and special ones you know yeah. special ones that uh there's there's a favorite system in geocaching so if you if you go and find a geocache and you think it's it's good you can award it a favorite point right okay so people um would then it's saying they're visiting an area they will think well what's the uh wh you know where's, where can i go geocaching where's where's the, what are the best geocaches mm -hmm. well you just look up which you just look it up uh which is the got the most favorite points you mm -hmm. see and um i've often we've often done that um just to, just so that we're you know we're, we're we're adding something to 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 a holiday or whatever yeah um you know we to, uh, to be honest it, when we go when we go a book a holiday, we always look to see them geocaches. <laughs> so that's the first thing before you book your hotel or book your tent in anyway. Look, see how many geocaches there are around. And uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why yeah. not? Um, so, what what GPS unit do you use, or what equipment would you recommend? Okay, we're from GPS training, so of course we're, we're very much uh, in with that technology. But you can do this really with the very very basic GPS unit, can't you? Oh, you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at present, I've got uh, an Etrex Twenty. Yeah, and. Um, before that, I had um, I can't remember the exact name. But that was another another Garmin, which was um, GPS CX six, six, sixty CSX was it or something? Yeah, the, that the was grey one. one. That, that looks like one. a mobile, phone, yeah. like an old mobile phone with the aerial sticking out the top. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, and but I mean, I found well over three thousand geocaches with that. Right. Um, and you know, extremely accurate, extremely rub robust. Yeah. You know, I I dropped that in streams and all sorts and. It, I never had any problems with it. I, I had a chat with you yesterday on the telephone before we recorded, it, and I was just saying we go to a big geocaching event called Mega every year. And normally, yeah. our customers, we take trade-ins of GPS units, but we go to Mega, we never take a trade-in because you guys absolutely wreck your units. You, actually, you get geocaching, they just come and they just this unit has been out day after day in all the weather. It's been dropped, yeah. it's been smashed. It's And you see this unit and go, how is this still holding together? And they go, we have this as a trade-in. You, you, could, you couldn't give it away. It's been so well. 
well used. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's a completely different than what we see with a walker who will just like pick up their unit you know, five or six times in the day and this kind of thing. You guys just like, it's, it's I don't know, it's on the dashboard of your car or something as you drive. Yeah, yeah. The next one is gets dropped as it as it falls as you get out of your car and things. And it just shows the, the durability of the GPS units, doesn't it? Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's been, you know, compared to sort of, because you can geocache with a, a smartphone. Yeah. But I mean, compared to that, you know, if you, if you drop yeah. a smartphone, you know, which plenty of people do, you know what, you, you know, the, the cost to you. Yeah. But I've, oh, I've, I've done all sorts of that, the GPS. And, and and every time I thought, oh, that's probably the end of it. And it, and it never is, you know, and it's, it did, works perfectly. Did your unit come preloaded with geocaches or not? Or, or was it previous? Now some of the garments come loaded with, well, quarter of a million of geocaches preloaded. I don't yeah. know. Um, I was just talking to Andy, our tech guy, this morning. He said they're updating that every two or three months. So it's not this. You no, know, every two or three months they put a different file in, which has more recent geocaching. There. I right. don't know. Are they out of date? I don't know. I don't know. Um, have you um, have you seen any of these units with these preloaded on and off? I, I have heard about them. Yeah, um, but I'm not sure if uh, if I was came. I don't think I was came with uh, right. with preloaded ones mm -hmm. um, but say that's easy enough just to log on to the web uh, onto geocaching.com and you really want to do that anyway don't you set up your own account and get get logging them don't you well this is it because um the thing is i like to filter uh, what geocaches uh, you, yeah. you know you can download a thousand for, yeah. uh, for any area but in, in amongst them are going to be difficult puzzles yes for a start and then there's a there's a a type of geocache called a multi-cache which which requires you to go to different places different waypoints yeah uh, before you get to the final one and that all that obviously takes a bit of time mm -hmm. i don't mind i don't mind doing uh, multi-caches but i would prefer to do certain ones yeah. um you know m traditional ones say uh you know when we're when we're out for a walk mm -hmm. rather than uh, but um so, so I like to filter them and just do ones uh, yeah. that. Uh, I, the other thing is, if if a, if a geocache uh, has had a lot of uh, what they call DNFs, did not find, uh -huh. um, there's a good chance that it's not there anymore. Yeah. I mean, you know, animals move things, and uh, uh, you know, people tidying up around. But you know, say, uh, well, right, I mean, people attach uh, geocaches to like um, benches. Yeah, you know, and. Um, Somebody might be well. It might get painted or something, and get and people think I don't know what this is, and just just take it away, mm -hmm. you know, throw it away. So you've got to. I, I don't like to be looking for something that's not there. Yeah. To be honest, you want to see that yeah. it's been found recently, and then you know you're you're a good good chance of finding it yourself, don't you? Well, that's right. Yeah. If, if yeah. you it, it, a lot of our listeners may have not geocached before, so if you had one word of wisdom for somebody who's geocaching for the first time, what would that be? You know, if you if they're first, new to geocaching. What, what, yeah, you've talked about a little bit about you know, how difficult some of them are, but if you had one pearl of wisdom that you want to pass on to our listeners, what would that be? Well, I would say don't be put off if you don't find one straight away. Right. Be because, um, you know, a lot of people start off geocaching and they, they, they don't really know what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if, you, if you do know anybody who, who's been geocaching, then it's it's a good idea to go along with them. Yeah, that's good advice. And, yeah, and that's what we did when we first started, um, because you know they're, they're really because you might be looking for something that's really difficult yeah. to spot. Yeah. Um, you know there there are some geocaches out there that, like I said, that are they're old and they've they've only got a handful of finds because they're so difficult to find. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I think when we first started, we we weren't put off. By the fact that we, hadn't, we, you know, we hadn't found loads uh, that that we, well that we that we were we went out and didn't find mm -hmm. some sometimes. Um, so you know we just we we stuck at it like really until you got but, to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And then think over your own finds. What is the one find that you kind of think that was the one that was the best find I've ever had, or totally out of the blue, or you you'd always strive to to get to this location. I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's open right. to your thoughts. Well, I was, I, when I was took the dog for a walk this morning, I thought, I know what he's going. He's going to ask me that question, <laughs> and um, I, I don't know. I don't think I could narrow it down because. Um, so I'm not going. I'm not going to give you just one. I'm going. The thing is, geocaching, like I said, is you know, is you can look for geocaches all over the world. So I've been, we've been to America. Yeah. 
and we went to Los Angeles and um, Las Vegas uh -huh. uh, when it was my 60th birthday. And when we were in Los Angeles, we went to um, the Bat Cave. So right. that's the, from the original um, Batman movie. Uh, fil uh, the original Batman film uh, program on yeah. television. All right, yeah, yeah. So series. Batman comes out of his, uh, his the Bat Cave, mm -hmm. and we went to that cave. You see, right. now, you know, people say geocaching takes you to places you would never normally go to, uh -huh. and that the Bat Cave isn't really uh, on the tourist map, right? You know, in Hollywood, yeah. it's there. People, yeah, yeah. people go. But it, it, I, I thought I'd love to go there, just see that, you know. So that was a that was a special one. Even though, you know, it doesn't look like Batman's cave or anything. It's just a cave. Mm -hmm. But it was great to think, well, this is where they filmed uh, the, you know, the Batman like. And then on the same holiday in Las Vegas, we went up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And there is up there this, um, what they call the E.T. Highway. Because yeah. uh, there somewhere in Nevada is the uh, secret U.S. government uh, uh well, you know, camp or whatever they call it. Supposedly they called Area Fifty One. Yeah, 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 yeah. And somebody spotted that that every so often there's a like a a marker at the side of the road. Now geocaches have to have a certain distance between them. It's like a tenth of a mile. Okay. So somebody, so, well, these two lads put a geocache every tenth of a mile for miles <laughs> and miles and miles. Right. I mean, it it, it stretches for sixty miles. I think there's there's well over four thousand of them. So you could start in Las Vegas and get a geocache every every tenth of a mile. You, it'd drive you crazy, to be <laughs> honest, because they're all the same. But we, while we were up there, I, bearing in mind we'd just come from Las Vegas, uh -huh. which is be, really busy, you know, I, we suddenly stopped and I thought, it's deadly quiet here. And it was an absolutely fantastic place. Right. And I thought, you wouldn't just come up no. this road and stop in the middle of nowhere and just yeah. you'd, you'd just carry on driving, yeah. you know. And I took loads of photographs, and I, I really I remember that. I'll always remember that going there because it was so. It, oh, it was a fantastic place, you know. And as you say, it took uh, you somewhere that you wouldn't normally go to, and that's oh, that's yeah, that, that's yeah, what makes for yeah. memories, isn't it? Really. Yeah, but I will say there's two two one uh, two I've been to in this country. One in the Lake District, which is called a Cathedral Cavern. Right. And it's a it's a, a man-made cavern where they've again somewhere else they made a film there um can't remember what it's called now unfortunately but you go in this cavern and it's beautiful and the sun shines in through the roof and there's a geocache in there and it's it's just a fantastic place i think it's owned by the national trust is that near grassmere uh, is it is it is that i think it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah i know exactly where that is yeah yeah so it's yeah. like a central column inside yes. this uh, this cave yeah yeah um well, i'll just give you a hint so where the geocache is <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's that one which was fantastic and also because uh, we're in Lincolnshire here, um, mm -hmm. fairly near in Nottinghamshire is uh, a cache called the Cold War cache right uh, and that is uh, a bunker that was built at the height of the Cold War okay yeah and a lot of those have been abandoned and filled in by farmers etc mm -hmm. well this one is still there and so you can just park not too far away walk up this field and then climb down into this underground bunker yeah I mean I'll be honest with you, it's grotty, you know what I mean? It's not, it's, it, it's seen better days, you know? uh -huh. But in there, it, it, there's a geocache. Fantastic. And, um, you know, that, again, people who would never dream of yeah. climbing down some rusty ladder mm -hmm. into dark, you know, but they do, you know? And, and that has got, going back to favourite points, that's got some of the most uh, favourite points uh, in the country because it's just, it's got people... They wouldn't normally do that sort of thing, yeah. and they, they'll remember that you see because they think, well, you know, that's an achievement. Well, I felt it was. You know, but, it uh, is. Is that yeah? It's something to talk over at a dinner party or something, isn't it? No, it's <laughs> somewhere you wouldn't yeah. normally go to. Like <laughs> where yeah, we just been thinking about so. your podcast as we just draw things to a close. Is there one of your podcast episodes or something that's happened in one of your podcast episodes that you think that was the one? That was a that was a great moment. Is there something that sticks in your mind? Well, I suppose there's been a few. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the one, like I said, about going to uh, Las Vegas and, and Los Angeles. But but quite recently, there was a, a geocache we found uh, near Retford, which was, uh, it was, it was actually looked like a, a landmine. <laughs> and, um, 
you had to get the because you got to get the log out of it. Did you it know it was going to be a landmine before you got there, or did no, you? No, no, I didn't no. actually. <laughs> and, and you know, I had, well, the worst thing about it is that because you couldn't get the log out, our friend Andy was was banging it on the ground. I said, <laughs> hey, "We're absolutely sure this is made of wood, aren't we?" You know, and um, we, we 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 suddenly had a. a we suddenly realised how you did it, you see, yeah. but we were recording at the time, which was nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I suppose that stands out. There's probably others, but after 70 odd episodes, sometimes. Yeah. Or just I blurs into one. I can't remember it? everything, you know, yeah. yeah. So, Brilliant. So, thank you for joining us. So, so for the listeners of our podcast, uh, if they want to find out any more about yeah your podcast, your, I know you've got an active Facebook page, and you also have a website. Where can they uh, find out more about what you what you guys are doing as well? Well, uh, each episode of the the podcast show is on iTunes. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you, if you use that, uh, we've also got, like I say, we've got a website, thepodcastshow.com. dot uh, com. All the episodes are on there. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter and all the usual stuff, you know. So um, if you if you got a podcast app, you just uh, type in podcast show. That's C A C H E, and uh, you should find us. That's brilliant. So thank you very much for joining us and being our first guest on the GPS Training Podcast. And uh, hopefully it's in, give people an insight into um, ge- um, geocaching and hopefully inspire them to go out to do more. So thank you very much for joining me, Pete. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. No problem, John. Thanks very much. So I hope you very much enjoyed um, our first ever interview on the uh, GPS Training Podcast. Um, if you have any ideas of future guests, please don't hesitate to get in touch. The next thing on the January podcast is Andy's top tip, both Andy's Garmin and SatMap top tips. So first of all, Andy, what's your Garmin top tip for January? Okay. And my top tips is actually the, the same principle for both makes of unit. Um, like we're so used to computers having software updates, whether it be a Windows or Mac computer, and those software updates will often improve or add a new feature or just make sure you've got the latest drives in your computer. You treat your handheld GPS exactly the same way as a mini computer. And from time to time, both Garmin and SatMap will bring out software updates that may add a new feature and improve something within the unit. And we always recommend that you check on a regular basis for software updates. I think this came from, I think you had a telephone call from somebody this week who had had Oregon 600 three years ago, hadn't you? And had a few problems with it. And yeah. you always say, have you updated the software? Yet? No, I've never updated yeah. the software. So I had a customer, he'd had a unit for about three years, never updated it. And one of the issues he was having was getting it to connect to his computer, which was very up to date. So that uh, potentially was one of the issues. But the problem he then had, he couldn't get on his computer to so update it. <laughs> So if I start with the Garmin, what you do with your Garmin units, there's a program called Garmin Express. If you haven't already got it on your computer, just Google it or Safari it, mm-hmm. put it into your, brow- your browser, search for Garmin Express for Windows or Garmin Express for Mac, download that program, and it basically self-explanatory. It lets you add your device, you sign into your Garmin account, and then it'll automatically check for updates in your Garmin if you've got it plugged in. Brilliant. On the SatMap units, the same principle, SatMap will bring out software updates from time to time. If you've got the older Active 10 or 12, the only way you can check for updates is using SatSync software, which you okay. download from SatMap's website. Now, that is, it wasn't really very Mac-friendly, I'll be honest, but if you've bought a new Active 20 unit, which is the latest SatMap, works brilliantly with a Mac. And what you can do, actually, to check updates... Uh, check for updates sorry on the new active 20 it has a wi-fi function so if you've got an active 20 you go into the wi-fi settings turn it on and then it, you, from the wireless page the wi-fi page you can automatically check for that's updates. brilliant isn't it that's, so it's that's much quicker and easier yeah you know? and that's what we all like now just log on to the wi-fi at home and update that software and how long do this usually take it's just the very small updates it's not, i mean some of the garmin ones i've noticed are a matter of 30 or 40 seconds um the sat map ones can be a couple of minutes right. um but i've not had anything go past a few minutes so okay. we're not talking about sometimes when your computer's yeah, updated so just take hours that's... and hours you know yeah. um i know we had a little glitch a little uh, before christmas with a garmin update that unfortunately had to be pulled it's very rare that happens i've never and heard of that ever before it was, it's the first time ever and to be honest they rectified it really quickly and about a week later there was a new update available so it is worth obviously checking for updates on a regular basis but it's certainly worth doing isn't it because it keeps everything up to date it sorts out any bugs it gets an improved battery life everything that people you used some re- read some reviews online and people are criticised a GPS unit. We know straight away. You go, actually, the first fix sorted that out. Have it been updated?
the second yeah. fix sorted that out. And when units are no month sold, they've got everything yeah. sorted out. Now, one thing on um, that sat map do a little bit different to Garmin. The final thing that I'll see on the updates when you check for software updates with the sat map, certainly with the Active 20, which is the newer unit, you'll often see two versions of one called the full version or a beta version. Now, what the beta version is, it's where sat map themselves have tested it but they haven't put it out in the marketplace yet. Right. So they're not saying there's going to be issues, but they're saying we haven't fully put it out to a range of customers. So potentially, as customers use the beta one, if you find any bugs, you would report it back to SatMap, and then what you may find pretty soon after that, that software update will have a few changes, and then there'll be a, that one will be made the full one, and there'll be another beta one. You can make the decision whether you want to put the full one on or, or put the beta one Brilliant. on. Brilliant. Know? So thank you very much, Andy. So Andy's top tips for this month is update your unit software on both a Garmin and a SatMap GPS. The big debate for January, when out walking, would you plan and follow a route or a track? So before we jump into this big debate, I Andy, mean, I think we need to clarify, or you need to clarify, what a route is and what a track is. Yeah, so a route is normally something that you pre-plan in planning software. So in Garmin's case, you would be using Basecamp software and you'd pre-plan your route in the software by using a route planning tool on the software. Right. A track, we always look at it's something that's been recorded in a GPS device. Okay. So someone goes for a walk with a Garmin or the sat map, they press the start for the recording, they stop the recording and save it, and then potentially share it with others, or you use it again yourself to navigate with. So normally it's a record of your So the trip, track's a little it? breadcrumb trail of, as you walk, your unit leaves a little trail behind you, you save it. A route is something you normally plan in software. Normally, the common way is by drawing straight lines between points yeah. that you're going to aim for on a map page on the software. That's, in simple terms, that's what we would look at the main difference. So the, the, one of the main things is the maximum amount of waypoints or track points in each of these. Is. So what in a route, what's the maximum number of waypoints? A waypoint is a collection of waypoints that have been joined together to yeah. create a route. And a track is actually a number of track points. Yeah. Every few seconds, yeah. your GPS, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And that creates that. Now, track. we sell two makes of GPS, a GPS training mainly. Now, in the SatMap units, they don't really stipulate a maximum number, but they do say... If you're getting up into the hundreds, you should try and keep, you know, you shouldn't get pa go past the hundreds, right. you know. There's no, they haven't actually got an exact figure, but you'll notice if you plan a route for a sat map and it, it, it and, it, and it, you get past, say, a couple of hundred points, it will start warning you, do you not want to try and reduce some of the points, okay. you know, but it won't stop it working in the unit. Now, with a Garmin unit, this is important. So when we talk about routes and tracks, so in a Garmin unit, if you're on the Garmin planning software, planning a route, and what we call direct routing, where you're simply drawing straight lines between point to point to point. Lots of videos on my online resource showing this. The maximum number of what we call, we call them via points, so it's every time you click with yep. your mouse on the map page, is 250. Right. This okay. is on the new generation units. We're covering units that have been out for the last three or four years. Yep. Obviously, some older units might work from less, but yes. uh, newer units. Now, the other type of route we have some customers might be using their garmin unit this is the, the handheld what we call the recreational units that we sell in our range of mm -hmm. products on our website and um, you may be using it for cycling and use this function on the software where you can do what we call a turn by turn route where it snaps on the roads that's more for the cyclist yeah isn't or it? if you bought one of the new maps from garmin that let you do some turn by turn route and off road mm -hmm. that figure is different it's a lot less it's 50 points but that's but when you you can just click at a point you no know, four miles away and that's that's class as one point even though it routes you by the road to get that. I'll point. give you a good example for that. So the two hundred and fifty points. I don't think anyone. If you were doing an off road walking route or hiking route, you're probably not going to go past two hundred and fifty yeah. points. If it was a long distance walk over a number of days, you would split it into days. Yeah. Now for a cycle route, just as an example, where you've only got these fifty points, this isn't the number of turns on the road. And the best example I can give you along the lines John was going there, if you clicked a a point and say Newcastle upon Tyne, the, the biggest city south of where we are, and then you're going to cycle to York and you click your next point at York, 100 or so miles down the road. Um, you've told the software you don't want to go on main roads. It will calculate the route for you. I know that route could potentially have more than 50 turns in it, but it's only classed as two points. Yes. The bit you clicked at the start yep. and the bit you clicked at the end. That's brilliant. Um, so that's the route points there. Uh, that's it. So that's Tra more for cycling. Um, so the walker will do direct routing, 250 waypoints. The cyclist, when creating a route, can have these 
points if they're using the turn by turn yeah. routing about 50 points but again that's ample because as you say those points could be hundreds of miles away couldn't they and then going to tracks yeah so when your device records a track it obviously records a lot more points than a couple of hundred if you do a long mm -hmm. walk and of course you can use this to navigate with again but the maximum number of points you can have in a track Again, going back to units that we've sold over the last four years, I would work to 10,000 points. Right. But interestingly, with the latest Garmin handheld unit, which is the Oregon 700, that'll actually work to 20,000 points. Right. And that's the 750 as well. So Oregon 700, 750 and yeah. 750T, isn't it? 20,000 track points. Wow. And when we talk about navigating with them, it's quite relevant when we go into these points, um, if we go into the, how we navigate yeah. with them. So that's the next thing. So when we're navigating on our GPS, how does our GPS act differently when we're navigating a, a route and a track then? Yeah. So most of us probably plan using a route on the planning software. Yeah. So we draw these straight lines between points and we send it to the unit. So what happens when you're navigating a route in a Garmin GPS, you get a pink line on the screen to follow um, and you move across the map and you try and keep as close as you can to that line that you've drawn. Now what will happen is with a Garmin unit, if you've got your tone settings turned on, as long as you get, it's normally within about 12, 15 meters approximately of any of these points, you get a tone alert from the unit. So the nice thing is that then draws your attention that you're coming to a waypoint or yeah. a track point, a waypoint, well it is a waypoint, and therefore you're going to change direction. So you don't need to look at your GPS screen, you're walking along the path, it pings at you, you can look, think, yeah. and it's going to tell you to go yeah. left or the arrow is going to change direction, isn't it? So in a Garmin, when you're navigating a track, the nice thing is you actually get the same pink line. So if you've recorded the track and then want to navigate with it weeks later, you still get a pink line to follow. Obviously you, you, in your search, boxes on your unit you search for a track instead of a route but you don't get these tone alerts right. now potentially if you're navigating a track that someone's recorded in their own gps it's more accurate than a planned route because every little turn that that person's made if they've shared the track with yeah. you so it can be potentially and when most people go on the internet they tend to you know like this is where this confusion has come from a lot of people are going on the internet and downloading what they think are routes but they're actually tracks aren't they and, and that's because actually it's, i've been for this walk or i've been for this cycle right there's my there's my gpx file this yeah. is a gpx file download it and then they go i can't find it in my unit because they go to where to route well actually it's a track isn't it because a lot of people have done long distance trails have recorded yeah. these they tend to record them as a track haven't they yeah yeah so that's the uh the, so the main thing is when you navigate your route, as you reach a waypoint, it's going to ping at you, so you draw your attention to it. When you navigate the track, it's going to be smoother because actually there's more track points in it, yeah. and actually it's not going to have this proximity alarm. So then, which one would do you prefer to use, or yeah, which one? If I said to you, you could navigate either with a route or a track, and you can never navigate with anything else, which one would you there's choose? Two ways I look at it, and actually, he's know. never going to give me give no. me so, I want no. one answer. And one answer. <laughs> now, this is a live session, and I realised I've just missed the point then as well. But it's it's quite relevant to what we're going to mention now. When John asked me what the main difference was between the track and route, the one thing I didn't say when you actually send the route to your unit where you've marked these little points that we call via points. Yeah. If it's been done as a route, you have a little drawn pin symbol yeah. on your unit. Now, when it's been done as a track, you don't have that, so it's smoother. It's a smoother, smoother so it's smooth it follows it. So, so, personally, I, I find it much quicker in the software to plan as a route. Yeah. There is a track, just to confuse everyone, there is an option in the software to, to convert it to, to a track. To, to, or to plan as a track. Right. I would never do that. So basically, I always, always plan, plan my it. routes. Um, what right. I'm gonna do in my walk or hike or as a route, yeah. But occasionally, if, especially if it's a, a route that's got lots of turns, or if it's a really long route, and I find as a track that sometimes load a bit quicker in the unit, if I don't want to see the drone pin icons, I'll, in the software, we have videos showing you this, so you go on our online resource where you can simply right click on a route mm -hmm. and say convert a track. So even though I've planned it as a route, personally, I send them to the unit often as a track because some of my routes have so many turns in it and it just makes it a bit clearer for me to see I don't see the drawn pins but to be honest it's personal because some customers like to see yeah. those drawn pins on the screen and obviously get the tone alerts. So which one are you going to choose then? Route or track? What would you navigate? Plan as a route and navigate as a track. Right, okay. I'm, 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 I, I'm quite traditional because actually I always, for years I've always planned as a route and always walked routes but I do a little bit of um, cycling and cycle the coast to coast a couple of years ago and I, I did a track for that and I downloaded a track for it so again if I'm cycling I tend to would use a track and if I'm walking I tend to use the route because I like that proximity alarm so hopefully that is a bit of an insight for the big debate for January which is the best navigator a route or a track
The next thing we're going to look at at the podcast, just briefly uh, now, is our nationwide GPS training courses. As you can imagine, January, we're absolutely rammed with people booking onto GPS training, G GPS training courses. We do nationwide courses from the um, South Downs, New Forest, right up to Fife in Scotland, everywhere in between. I'm not going to reel off the list. You go onto our website, have a look at places we do uh, GPS training courses. And I'm doing this to give everybody a heads up. You know what? Get yourself, if you want to get yourself uh, um, up to speed on your GPS unit, get yourself booked on because um, they are getting, getting very, very uh, fully booked. So we do a, a two-day Garmin course and a one-day um, map course. So Garmin course first and the two-day courses, and we deliver that nationwide from, I say, the New Forest, South Downs, right up to the Pipe in Scotland. Day one, just briefly, what, what are we doing on day one on this course? So day one's the practical side of using your GPS. So it's getting the grips so your GPS unit. With your Garmin GPS unit, we'll take you right from the basics at the start making sure the unit's set up correctly we talk about using waypoints marking points on the ground and of course navigation understanding if you sent a route to the unit how you navigate You've got the software loaded some basic settings in the planning software and then we give you some exercises to do where you, you play about planning some routes in the software showing you how to amend them get them on your unit and then the nice thing is we all go out and do the walk that we've all planned together in the software and then you practice some of the things you did on day one it's a nice refresher because you're doing it for real again out on a walk you know that's brilliant so that's this that's the second day which is on so first day is on getting grips your unit and second day on garmin base camp and i say most people book um, and we're very much encouraging people to to book onto both days sat map course we do it in one day rather than two do it in one day but we just do that in northumberland lakes and the south downs so what do we cover on the sat map course so the reason the sat maps are one day course i mean the two ways you can look at it sat map only have really the i know they've got the new active 20 now but the products are so similar and um, you haven't got a lot of ch different yeah. choice of units so you, you can go through a lot more in a day when you've only got that one style of unit plus the planning software for sat map is a software unlike the Garmin that needs a Wi-Fi connection to use and most of the locations we use even when you're in some a town or village where there's high speed internet you suddenly have eight or nine customers all yeah. with their computers on you wouldn't be able to go through the planning software we do do an introduction on it on day one but everyone gets access to our online training course after the, the sat map course which has lots of videos on using the planning software so what we're covering on the sat map unit is again like the garmin we do some basic gps terminology mm -hmm. getting settings in your unit you know making sure you know how to go through the different screens load your maps etc and then like the garmin we go out and practice marking waypoints uh walking with the unit to see yourself moving on the map page knowing how you can do a track back an emergency back to the start and the tutor will do a demonstration in the afternoon on using the sat map planning software yeah. but you don't get to use it yourself but you all get to see the tutor doing it you'll send a route to your units and then you all go out and walk that route but you do get access to the online training course and i should have mentioned on the garmin one we also give you access yeah. to our, if you book the two-day course which most people do, you get access to an online training course and as that's, well. Yeah, because that kind of full of videos, and then you can go and have a look at that. And also on the courses, we give manuals out, don't we, now? This is something we started two or three years ago, manuals as well. And you get a little short guide just as a refresher mm. on what we've done, um, which you can use on the course or after the course. I think the main thing for me on the courses is, obviously you get to meet people all nice yeah. and friendly, uh, you get to ask the tutor questions face-to-face, -face, sometimes harder on the phone and via email. So a nice, friendly group. You're with other people using the same GPSs. And the big thing for me, after the course, we often get asked about, oh, I didn't write as many notes down as I should. That online training course that you get for free after the course, um, you can utilise and it helps you refresh back on everything you learn on the course with all the videos. That's so. brilliant. So, yeah, so, so we're doing this in January because it is when everybody's booking courses. Get yourself booked onto the courses. I'm just going to... Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be nice, I'm not have a little rant. I should have a rant, but I'm going to just stress to people, you know, get yourself... If you see a course that is free, get yourself booked on it. Because, again, so many conversations with people who kind of, like, will ring up you know, a month before and say, oh, that course is on in the South Downs is fully booked. When I looked a month ago, there was place left, and can you squeeze me on? We can't squeeze people on. You know, we have a maximum of eight people on each of yeah. these courses just because we want to give that good quality course. So, again, if you see a course that's got places on, get yourself booked on. Don't leave it and then bring up a month before thinking that oh because i spoke to andy or myself or someone we can we can squeeze you on we can't do that so again at the moment i see a lot of people who you know ringing up saying hey i look i spoke to you before christmas our course and now i, I want to go on it. it's fully booked well that's sadly the way it is isn't it so if you see a course that's got a place on it and you want to come on it get yourself booked on it 
Finally, for the podcast this month, we'll look at Irish mapping options for Garmin GPS. So this came from a suggestion from Mark Inman. Mark Inman listens to the GPS Train podcast, so welcome. Um, yeah, hi, Mark, and thank you for listening to it, and thank you for feeding back. So he says, um, many thanks uh, for the podcast. He very much enjoys it. One thing that you would like to know a little bit about more, because we've been discussing mapping on past podcasts, is Irish mapping options. He said originally for a Garmin GPS, but we're also going to cover it uh, for a sat map. So we'll do sat map first, and then we'll come to uh, the Garmin options. So um, the the reason we do this is uh, with any GPS unit, it's Great Britain mapping we're getting with it, not UK mapping. That's right, Andy. So if you look on our GPS store and you're wanting to buy a unit from us, um, starting with sat map, we bundle the sat map units with a nice selection of ordnance survey mapping, various options for Great Britain, 1 to 50, 1 to 50 and 1 to 25, or just 1 to 25. And Great Britain doesn't include Ireland. So it's not Northern or Southern Ireland. Um, now with sat map, they have a nice choice of mapping that we can get in for you. Please, if you're buying a unit from us and you want some island mapping, just l let us know, you know, give us a call over the phone and we can order it in, test it in the unit and send it out with the unit for you. Um, what SatMap have as a choice, they have a, an option of um, something called Adventure Map for the whole of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, which is a map card based on open source data. So it's not as detailed as Ordnance Survey, it's members of the public and organisations putting mapping together. It's free, open source this, yeah. or open street data. It's funny because they describe it whole adventure map 1 to 25k, but it's not actually what 25k mapping is. Again, it's open source mapping, which is about the same scale as that, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a, I mean, it's a good budget option because it's only top me £53 for a whole of Northern and Southern Ireland, but it's not Ordnance Survey, um, but that's the first sort of option they've got. They then do have the whole of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland as 1 to 50 but it also has this thing called hotspots where they just pick certain areas, like so the Giants Causeway, Mourn Mountains, uh, Loch Earn. There's yeah. a couple of other places mentioned. Again, we can clarify that with you if you need help on the phone. So basically, you get the whole of 1 to 50 Ordnance Survey for Northern and Southern Ireland and a few hotspots at 1 to 25. But that's £137. Um, so that's another option. And then the two options where they split Northern and Southern Ireland, you can get Northern Ireland 1 to 50, still with these hot spots at 1 to 25, £74. And if it's Republic of Ireland that you want Southern Ireland only, they do that at 1 to 50, not 1 to 25, 1 to 50 at £95. But again, you know, give us a ring, have a chat. You yeah. know now there's a few options for your sat map if you want us to order in a map card, either just to post out or to go out with a unit you're buying from us. We, yeah. we can order that in, even though we don't show them on our website. I know I had a guy actually who was just, I think it was just before Christmas, I don't know where you were, I don't know, I ended up dealing with it. He ended up wanting, but he said, oh, I'll have the both the adventure maps and also the one to 50,000 yeah. with hotspots. And actually Garmin put them on the same oh, card. Sat uh, sat sorry, SatMap yeah. put this on the same card. So I rang SatMap and they said, yeah, that's not a problem. And they gave us the price. I think it was about the same price, but they put it onto one card because SatMap can do this. They kind of burn the cards according to... Yeah, again, story. so if anyone's wanting anything a little bit different, just because it's not shown on our website, please give us a ring and we can have a chat with you over the options. Yeah, that's you know? brilliant. So then Garmin, Garmin again... No, um, no uh, ordnance survey mapping options. In the olden days, you used to be able to use the bird's eye bow, which we talked about a little bit earlier, yeah. to download the Irish mapping, Northern Irish mapping, yeah. sorry, but that's that's come to an end, hasn't right. it? Unfortunately, at the moment, Garmin haven't got an option for ordnance survey mapping for their units for Northern or Southern Ireland. I think it's to do with licensing, and the demand, I don't think, was there for Garmin for paying the licensing fees. That you know, It's along those lines. So it may change in the future. Mm -hmm. They may bring it back. But what are the options at the minute? So if you've got a Garmin, uh, one of the newer generation Garmin colour screen units, and you want some mapping for Northern or Southern Ireland, there's a few options of what you mm -hmm. can do. Uh, if you're buying a unit from us, we have access to some good open source, open street mapping that covers both Northern and Southern Ireland. Um, we get it from a good source where you can do it yourself for free. We're not trying to charge anyone for doing this mapping. If you're buying a unit from us, we'll actually put it on the memory of your unit for free yeah. if you let us know when you're buying the unit. We can put it on a micro SD card and send it out if you haven't got it. We do have to charge for that. It's for the time of, you know, it takes us a bit of time to yeah. download it. The cost of a micro SD card and obviously checking the mapping's working okay and we put a little guide with it as mm -hmm. well. It does actually say that on our website and our product page, it just says if you want Irish mapping, put in the delivery instructions. So if you're buying something online, just put in the delivery instructions. Please put um, Irish mapping on it and we'll just drop that on the internal menu. Yeah. So again, remember, this is open street, open source mapping. So it is taken from members of the public and organisations putting the mapping together 
we've had good experience with them yeah. and we've had good feedback but you've always got that you know it's not ordinary we do uh, have a few units that irish people will buy from us and actually they are walking every day or every week or they go walking with this map in the feedback we're getting from people is it's really good you know yeah. they, they, they they're not ringing up saying oh it's not very good mm -hmm. the feedback we've had is very very good so that's the right. that's the open source yeah. it doesn't option. have elevation data built in but it does have contour lines marked on it right. and of course your gps if it's got an altimeter will show you the height as mm -hmm. you walk and then we've got the famous topo lots of confusing topo topo light uk and ireland isn't it yeah. so garmin have a nice product called topo light uk and ireland which you have to download from Garmin themselves. It's £19.99 to download to your unit or onto a blank micro SD card. It's actually based off open source right. uh, mapping data as well. Has contour lines at 50 metres. It does actually have elevation data, which is quite nice, mm -hmm. you know. I still find sometimes the open, I know it can depend on what open source mapping you're using, the ones we tend to get seem to have a few extra tracks and trails on. But I still, you know, the light mapping, it's still a nice product to have in the background mm -hmm. if you have, when, you know, we haven't got lots of choice, unfortunately. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, it's worth having a look at. It's on, if you search on Garmin's website, just Topo Light UK and Ireland, right. that'll come up. And then oh, new units get this Topo Active. We can download the Topo Active, can't you? But it's, uh, Topo so Active comes on. The third on option then that covers Ireland. Um, Garmin have a map product called Topo Active Europe. Now you actually get this installed on units like the Etrex Touch units that we sell. Have it for both Western and Eastern Europe. So it covers forty-seven countries, which includes uh, Great Britain and Ireland and mm -hmm. Southern Ireland. Um, some of the smaller Etrex twenties and thirties have Western Europe. So again, that would cover. Um, island so the topo active map we tend to look at it more as a sort of low level walking recreational mapping cyclists love it it doesn't have contour lines on it yeah. but it does have elevation data mm -hmm. built in and it will show some of your main major trails but again it's not going to be as detailed as an ordnance survey map uh, now you get that free on those units you can do it as a download from garmin for 44 pounds right. 99 you would you'd have to put it on a blank micro sd card it's not going to fit on, on the too, memory yeah. of your unit because the units we sell that have it already on have special extra memory uh, mm -hmm. to take that preloaded mapping that's brilliant so for the garmin we've got the open source mapping which again if you buy a unit from us we can pop that on the internal memory uh, there's a topo light uk in ireland and you just told us about and then the topo active uh, europe which can be downloaded directly from garmin or alternatively if you're in a gps you like e-tracks touches and oregon 750t that has that mapping on it so hopefully mark that's um, answered your question and hopefully giving you some option for your irish mapping so to finish off this, our fifth podcast, many thanks for listening. Uh, let, and please do let us know if you'd like anything covering in the podcast, especially um, if you know someone who's doing something interesting with a Garmin, G or Garmin and SatMap GPS unit. Please do let us know and then we can uh, we can do some recording with them. As, you'll, well, as you've already heard, we can do some remote recording now. So we can just get people on Skype and actually do some recording there. So please get in touch if you know anybody who, uh, who wants to do that. Um, please do give us a call, especially if you're thinking of buying a new GPS unit or alternatively want some training for a unit that you've just got. Please do tell your friends about the podcast and also about GPS training. And don't forget you can watch the recording of the podcast on our Facebook page, which is GPS Training UK, or on our YouTube channel, GPS Training. And don't forget, finally, to subscribe and rate this podcast on whatever platform or podcast player that you listen to. So... Many thanks, Andy, for joining me on this, the fifth ever GPS training podcast. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back uh, next month um, with our uh, sixth podcast. And don't forget, on the 1st of February, we've got our live GPS, claim, uh, GPS training clinic on Facebook. So put that date in your diary and we'll see you online then. So thank you very much and thanks for listening. Thank you.